Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 72 of the J Situation podcast. I'm recording this on July 27th, 2021. Boy, howdy. Glad to be here with you folks today. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, it's hot as hell outside, <laughs> which is great. It's, it's just so great. <laughs> uh, I just came back from some field testing, so pretty busy right now with office work uh, for clients and, and you folks, so forgive me. Uh, there will probably not be a publication for you this week. Uh, there, there's too many Pew Science activities uh, that are taking precedent um, this week, so you'll have to stay tuned. Uh, however, I can assure you the wait will be worth it. Uh, if you're a new listener to the podcast, you may be asking yourself, the wait for what? <laughs> well, well, friend, uh, the wait for silencer data and analysis. That's right. Uh, silencers, they are something you can purchase legally. And if you're interested in, in purchasing a silencer for your firearm, a good place to buy them would be from Silencer Shop. <laughs> the J Situation podcast is proudly sponsored by Silencer Shop, the most efficient and intelligent way to purchase silencers. They've done a lot of cool stuff, like create an easy system that minimizes the likelihood of errors in your paperwork, and, you know, they pioneered the use of a QR code on the actual Form 4 so that the ATF can scan the code instead of inputting all of your personal data themselves. It does help. It helps the process, guys. It makes it a little more simple for you. That's the reason Silencer Shop has grown. They continue to innovate. They have a network of nationwide dealers where silencers are legal. You can use their kiosk, do your fingerprints and your photos electronically. You cut down on errors. You simplify your silencer purchasing process. Money back guarantee. No transfer fees. I'm telling you what, man. No paperwork errors. Just you and your silencer with no drama. It truly is silencer ownership simplified. It is. Wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. But secondly, and most importantly of all, this podcast is brought to you by Pew Science, pushing the silencer industry forward one test at a time. Uh, I started Pew Science in 2019 uh, to offer the entire firearms industry and the world uh, standardized silencer testing that could be trusted and would produce meaningful conclusions for all that consume the data. Uh, and, and, and that we are well on our way um, to basically forming a, a worldwide movement with it, so I'm pretty proud of it. You know, you can visit PewScience.com for the suppression rating. It is the simplest and most accurate hear and safe rating for your suppressed small arms. It's based on true human sound perception, okay? It's all explained in the Sonsor Sound Standard on the website. It walks you through gunshot noise, it's sort of like a Wikipedia article, but it's way cooler. Okay, uh, skip to section 5 for the suppression rating. It'll basically boil it all down for you there. And when you're ready, you can progress to the standard and check out the reviews in section 6. All the your favorite silencers are listed there. And, you know, if that's too much for you, you can head to section 7, which is the ranking section. And there's a simple database tool for you to sort and kind of view all the, the published data to date. And then if, if you find something there you like, you can work backward and there's links to the in-depth reviews in section six for you. Okay. If you have any questions, reach out to the website or email me at tech at pewscience.com and I'll be happy to walk you through it. Uh, as always, if you are a manufacturer and you would like to use Pew Science for private testing and consulting services, which is one of the main things that Pew Science does, uh, you know, I was testing this weekend. I was doing a, a couple of, of private test programs for some R&D clients. Uh, there is a form on the website with which you can submit an inquiry for such, um, a re you know, a request. If you have some kind of need that you have as your uh, for your business, and you, maybe you make silencers, or you make weapons, and you you need to have your weapon system uh, evaluated, you know, with a third with by a third party uh, in accordance with the silencer sound standard. That's what we do. That's what Pew Science does. So you can can reach out through there. You know, um, all your content information and, and the details of your test program are held in strict confidence, uh, unless you want to release it to the public, in which case, of course, Pew Science can help you do that. Uh, we've done, it se uh, done several so far, and you'll be seeing some more very soon. You can support this podcast, Pew Science, and our testing 
by joining with a membership at pewscience.com. It's very important to do that. Uh, it does help the effort. Um, but if for some reason you can't, you can uh, give the podcast a good rating on, on your podcast provider there and iTunes and stuff like that. Uh, help spread the word. Let's folks know that silencers and guns are awesome. Okay, let's go. I got, I'm got. i going to try to make this quick today. We have a lot to do. So I have some very quick topics, but they are important. So we'll we'll uh, we'll kind of get through them. All right, I have four of them prepared for you today. Topic one, uh, just got back for some field testing. Uh, 338 Lapua Magnum has started. Uh, I did some military MRAD stuff. And, you know, the 556 Mark 18, uh, almost tested that. But then I couldn't <laughs> Didn't talk about that. Um, topic two, uh, another 11 and a half inch mid-length gas upper. I mean, why not, frankly? Uh, also, I, I picked the, the, the Knight's Armament URX4 uh, for this one because apparently uh, I like to suffer uh, for aesthetic reasons. <laughs> topic three, um, some administrative items to take care of uh, for you. Uh, Pew Science, odds and ends. Uh, I need to address some folks, uh, some stuff for you folks. And then topic four, of course, welcome to all the new Pew Science members. You are the salt of the earth. So through you. All things are possible. Okay, let's move into topic one in a time of six minutes and 14 seconds. Okay, that's a pretty good time there. Yeah, so just got back from some field testing. 338 Lapua Magnum has started. It has. And then also some military MRAD stuff and, man, the Mark 18. Ugh, can't catch a break with that thing. So, yeah, field testing. I told you it was coming up. And uh, I, have ha- I-, I have several test days in the works it is a it is a very busy time right now. Uh, this testing um, was mostly, or it was actually almost completely contract work for Pew Science. Um, some of it was Pew Science funded, but the vast majority was client funded work, um, of which you will see a few things um, from from that test session. Uh, some of it you might see relatively soon. Actually, uh, the majority of uh, uh, of it, the majority of the work. Uh, you, you you'll probably never see uh, due to it, because it was performed for a military contract solicitation and so the the stuff probably won't be published uh, to the website um, ever um, you know and, and then the products themselves might actually never be seen by you either so it's one of those things but you know that also helps pay the pew science bills right so this is work that pew science has to do to continue the effort okay this is all part of it it's all part of it but um, so if that changes and you end up seeing some of the other stuff, I'll let you know. But don't hold your breath for a lot of it. Now, the stuff I can tell you about so far, boy, how did I tell you what? I shot, you know, this is crazy too. I shot the 20 inch 338 Lapua Magnum Pew Science Test Host. Um, that gun is loud. It is. It's loud. And uh, it has some forceful recoil unsuppressed. It does. I tell you what, not the most fun, that weapon unsuppressed. No. It's not, um, you know, bare muzzle without a break. It's not fun to shoot, uh, unsuppressed. Now, 20-inch barrel, 338 Lapua Magnum. It's the Seiko TRG, the TRG M10, the the official 338 Magnum rifle test host for Pew Science. Yeah. Uh, we can also, we can do Norma Mag with it as well, uh, and, and even 308, because, you know, you I, I have barrels. I can change the barrels. So that's wild, right? So I can do that. Um, I tell you what, I did test a 338 silencer on the gun. That was awesome. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You get recoil from a few different things, right? You guys understand rifle recoil, right? So, you know, like in, in an unsuppressed rifle, you have the, you know, you got the bullet leaving the gun. Okay. So that momentum is transferred to your shoulder. That's a momentum transfer mechanism, right? Okay. And you feel that you understand that's part of the source of recoil from a gun right okay cool well what do you what do we know about the gas dynamics in the barrel before and after the bullet right you have the precursor flow you know coming out of the barrel before the bullet leaves right the bullets pushing it out and then you have flow after the bullet leaves after uncorking all that flow that was pushing the bullet pushing the bullet so fast all those combustion products those products produce a thrust right and so that adds the recoil yeah okay it's, just, it's like literally you get, you get your afterburns afterburners going and it's pushing your your gun back all that thrust coming out of the barrel right well <clears throat> excuse me so um with the silencer however 
You're going to slow that expansion of combustion gases to the atmosphere, right? What are you doing? Well, you're trapping. You're trapping the thrust. You're you're coupling it to the weapon system. You know, you're still losing your bullet, right? You're still pushing, you know, the bullet's leaving. That momentum's being transferred, but you know, trapping gas is awesome. It prevents it from producing that jet thrust, and bingo, bango, you get recoil reduction. And, and, and is there still recoil? Yeah. It's still going to be recoil, but, I mean, you still have the projectile momentum, but... But man, that silencer, if you have a good silencer, it is going to reduce your recoil. On the, on these huge Magnum cartridges, you're going to notice a difference. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, some some folks use brakes on the end of silencers, you know, to help try, you know, like the Silencer Co. Anchor Brake. We've talked about that before, the Dead Air E-Brake. They, they're, they're doing something a little differently. That has nothing to do with, the, the, they're actually trying to, they're trading that, that, gas trap and trying to use the gas to chain to mitigate other recoil kinematics like other like jumping of the of the uh of the system they're not that you know what i mean they're they're like well they're what would you say they're robbing peter to pay paul i guess would be a, a way to say that um but uh, figuratively but we're not really talking about that. I'm not really discussing the, the, the breaks on the end of silencers here. I'm just talking about the difference between unsuppressed and the use of a silencer on a Magnum rifle. So I can tell you, man, unsuppressed 338 Lapua Magnum from a 20-inch barrel. That's actually a pretty short barrel for that cartridge. Unsuppressed, it sucks, dude. It's loud. Like, like over 174 dB loud. And if you want to know what the difference is between like 174 dB and 171 dB, like the difference between like 338 Lapua Magnum and 308, it's like 25% different pressure. You're like, Jay, that's only 3 dB. Like, that's not even that much. Well, please go to the Sonster Sound Standard on PewScience.com and look at uh, the graphs I've prepared for you <laughs> to explain to you. How decibel is a logarithmic unit, <laughs> and you're dealing with like around ten thousand pascals versus eight thousand pascals, or so, depending on the load. <laughs> yeah, I mean, crazy, right? You're like between six and eight thousand pascals, and then up to ten thousand pascals. It's a little bit different ball game, my friends. So yeah, but suppressed, you put a you put a silencer on. Uh, a 338 it sucks way less it does and with a good silencer it can be quieter than you would think it would and that's crazy and so here here's a hint for you you probably already know what, it, what i tested but here's a hint for you a pretty quiet 308 hunting setup like that's what you can do to a 338 20 inch barrel with the right silencer so if that's some foreshadowing for you it's apparently possible because i how do I know that? Well, I just tested it, I analyzed it, and uh, did the math. So you'll see that coming in the future. You will. So that that happened. So I was p pretty pleased with that test. That was that was definitely um, valuable information. Now another thing I got to shoot, and 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 you'll see more. Sorry, I can't tell you more yet. Um, another thing I got to shoot. Uh, part of what you're probably not going to see, but I can tell you this much is I I, I was shooting. Uh, a specialized version um, or versions of a Barrett MRAD. It's a it's a rifle. It's a it's, you know, th and that I said that rifle. It's bolt action. That rifle compared to the Seiko TRG, it, it's just not worth it. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't know how much the Barrett MRAD costs, uh, but the Seiko is really nice, and the MRAD MRAD is not really nice. It's just not and one one really really big complaint. I have about the MRAD is that when you convert it to 308, and you, you like you know you untorque the what you do to convert. Okay, so there's a couple things you do real quick. I don't didn't really want to go into this, but just so you understand what the mechanism is. So when you convert a Barrett from the Magnum cartridge to a 308 normal cartridge, you would shoot like what you do is you first you you take the you take the bolt apart which is actually not that hard they give a little tool for it and it's a, it's you gotta use a hard surface it's a pain in the butt but you can do it so you do that it's interesting it's, it's not the worst i i actually the bolt's kind of cool so you change that but then so you you disconnect the or you untorque there's two clamping bolts 
uh, on the receiver. You untorque them. Um, it's a, I think, it, oh, is it 140 inch pounds? 140 inch pounds. So you untorque those bolts, um, and then you remove the barrel, and then you slide the other barrel in. There's a notch. You can only index one way. You kind of you you turn it. You 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 slap it back, slap it in, rotate the thing until it falls into the index notch, and then you you know alternate those tightening of those two bolts back to 140 inch pounds. Uh, so that you can, uh, which is like around between 11 and 12 foot pounds, so you can, uh, you know, secure the barrel. And, you know, after, you know, you change your, your bolt, you get that back together, and then you're pretty much done, except the one thing that's super important that obviously you need is your, you got to change the magazine, right? So you change your magazine, and you got, you change from like a 338 magazine, for example, to a 308 magazine. Well, this 308 magazine, much like in the TRG from the Seiko, when you use a 308 magazine, it, well, 308 rounds are shorter. They're not magnum rounds. So what do they have to do? Well, they had to change the the magazine geometry to feed, right? Well, the Barrett 308 mag, I don't know, man. It just doesn't feed the same way. As, and you know what I'll have to do, and I didn't do this today, but I will. I will take a picture of the two magazines to show you the difference because it would be it's way better to show you visually. I just don't like the way their 308 magazine is made to fit the footprint of the Magnum chassis. I mean, the Magnum receiver of the the MRAD, which is a t intended to be a 338 gun. Um, when you when you go to chamber a 308 round in the MRAD, there is a high probability, meaning a significant probability that that round is going to hang up on the feed on the feed ramp of the barrel in a bolt action. I'm talking with NATO 762 NATO. This is not a crazy. Oh well, you know, Jay, you should you should use longer rounds because everyone knows that no 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 762 by 51 nato okay this is i'm not no this is xm80 this 762 by 51 nato xm80 should chamber in a three way bolt gun i'm sorry like don't give me excuses talk talk start talking to me about ojive and length of blah 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 this is a bolt gun <laughs> miss me with that fam <laughs> So yeah, that happened during the test program. That was a that was a problem. It was a problem. Very expensive problem. And I don't really that right there and I'm telling you that right there I already kind of felt that some of the gun was chintzy or, and I'm using that adjective to describe my subjective opinion of the fit and finish and feel of the MRAD itself. That that malfunction with the 308 or malfunctions, sorry, just really, 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 it, it grinds my gears, frankly, and I don't, I just, it's not acceptable to me, it's just not acceptable to me, and um, yeah, it's not my cup of tea, Max felt cheap, gun felt cheap, it's not something I would use or shell out money for, now, I don't really need an MRAD, but you might, someone listening to this, you might, and I'm telling you that if you do, you might want to look at some alternatives, dude. Like, I, I don't think you, I don't know why you would, I, I shot it a lot. I shot it a lot. Actually, I shot, I put a few rounds down this, down this gun, guys, and um, I can unequivocally say I, I have actual time behind the rifle and this, and I have time behind the Seiko now, and the Seiko, I prefer the Seiko, I do. And just my opinion. Now, this, the Seiko is refined. It's more comfortable. It's higher quality. Just more well put together. I really feel like it's it's quality versus versus a bargain brand or something like the Barrett, the Seiko versus Barrett. I, I think that's in the MRAD. I don't know if this is a particular MRAD I, I'm using that I was I was shipped for for testing. It could be. I don't know. I, I doubt it. I, I think an MRAD is an MRAD. Um, now, I should say I didn't have any problem with the Magnum testing of the MRAD. I only had problems with the, with the 308 testing. But that alone, to me, is 
that that to me that's not acceptable uh feeding problems in a magazine with standard nato ammo it's not it's not and you know you know how i had to fix it right you know how i knew it was the gun if i pushed the magazine up with my like my weak hand and then chambered it would work so it's the fit of the magazine and the gun how is that possible dude and when you do it when you put the mag in the gun it's a little loose you're like this is weird when i put the magazine in my seiko hmm and i say my seiko because i'm not giving it back <laughs> no i was told i could keep it <laughs> you promised um yeah they promised they did they promised um no but the seiko doesn't rattle the 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 um yeah so uh so yeah i just like it's like one of those things like i don't i don't know man fit and finish so i i hate to say it i do but that's what i feel when i mess with the two rifles now would i have thought this about the barrett if i didn't have the seiko i mean maybe not overall you know maybe maybe the seiko gave me a reference point that was high enough above the threshold to influence my opinion you know what i mean i'm telling you other because other than the mag feeding thing all of this opinion about the mrad is subjective it is so i'm not basing it on anything else concrete necessarily i can't say anything more about the particular weapon system i tested because it's not public but i i just i thought i i noticed this and like i don't think you get a lot of honest opinions from people who shoot both those rifles like who 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 shoots a Seiko TRG and a Barrett MRAD in the same session like back to back like well not back to back but in the same day puts a bunch of rounds through them and like tells you about it like you've what you could probably count that on two hands right about who would do that like who who would be shooting that's weird like no one does that like no one you talk to probably right i mean like uh, some of you listening are like oh i shoot MRAD every day i was like okay relax <laughs> <laughs> you're not normal <laughs> so like i figured like i wouldn't i wanted to share because like i feel like someone out there is going to find this information useful at least at least my anecdotal opinion and report may help you okay so that's my goal so what else what else did i test oh oh yeah i tested some more 30 caliber silencers um some of some of the ones i tested you have heard of and you probably see that data eventually maybe the data will be released maybe it won't We'll see what the folks decide about that. Did some 308, 300 blackout, super and subs. Um, oh, oh, actually also tested some 30 caliber silencers you may not have heard of. And some of them were pretty good. So excited to show you those. Uh, one thing, and you probably will see those soon. One thing that I didn't get to and that I thought I was going to get to was the Mark 18 testing for you guys uh i am sorry <laughs> like and if you don't think i'm sorry i got news for you because like i'm sorry for me more than i am for you frankly like i just ran out of time or we ran out of time it just it did it was not it was an it was something i wanted to tack on with you know pew science dollars after the the contracted tests and i just you know hey contracted tests come first and so i I just ran out of time. The logistics didn't work out, um, but rest assured, rest assured that it is uh, in my next test matrix, it is going to be so for my next outing. And so it's coming. I am about to do that coming up. So 556 testing is coming up. Now I have a lot. I have a lot of 556 data already. Like I've done 556 testing, but it took a lot of testing and analysis before I really 100% decided on what to publish as the standard platform. Okay, it's been, a, it's been a while and it's been a process. Now, all of you folks wondering where 5.5.6 data is, well, the answer is it's, it's in the archives and you aren't going to see that data because it, you're, you're going to see data in a standardized way such that the entire pedigree can be uniform and we can build this out properly. I can't... I can't just release everything I've done because it's not going to work. So if you're just tuning into this <laughs> or if you don't understand this, anything I publish becomes public record. Okay. And it's referenced throughout the world like wildfire. 
Okay, so it's gonna spread. So we need to make sure it's proper and consistent. If I were to publish data and then publish something not comparable with, with the initial publication I published, like let's say I had a, a host variable that was different and I published it and then I changed the host weapon and then published other data, what would you do? Or what would people do? They would say, well, Jay, uh, I don't like how you didn't control variables here and there. I'm like, ah. and it would be it would be fine for me. Like I would find value in it and some of you listening would find value in it. But guess what people would say at large? Well, they would freak out. And then they would it would it would it would lower the it would reduce the legitimacy in, in, subjectively in people's eyes because they they wouldn't understand and then they'd question things. So, okay, well we can't have that. You have to understand like if this was just a hobby thing, and I was just publishing stuff on a forum or a YouTuber, oh let's see what this happens today. Do do do. Like let's welcome to the J situation where we test guns. Nah, dude. Like. <laughs> This is like the most, this is the most exact and meaningful repository of science or test data uh, in the world. And so we got to do it right. And it's, it's a responsibility. It's, 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 it's a burden that we have created by creating Pew Science. And we must be consistent. So it just, it is what it is. Um, it, you know, it is what it is. You, 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 if, if, if I gave you, like, let's say I changed the lower receiver and a buffer. Just, I'm not saying that happened, but let's say I changed something. And then I, and I showed you, you know, ear waveforms. Well, then you say, well, how would it change if you did H2 buffer with XYZ? You know what I mean? Like, you, you guys are already asking questions. Well, how does it change with the mount changing? <laughs> it's like, guys, <laughs> really? <laughs> That's what you're asking? You know what I mean? So it's like. So it is for this reason that Pew Science continues to define the state of the art. Okay, state of practice—it's really defining the state of practice for the characterization of suppressed small arms. Okay, because I care enough to do it correctly for you. I, I really do. Like I and I know you're, I know you're like, oh, I want the semi-auto data. It's like, dude, I know, I know. I care enough to do it correctly. I do, and I I, I want to do it without compromise. So this is what it is. Now that should give you plenty of info, though. You now if you're still chomping at the bit for 556 data and you can't wait, that's fine. Just look at the 30 caliber bolt action data and use your best judgment, dude. Like if your AR-15 is tuned and set up right, a loud silencer is gonna be loud. A quiet silencer is gonna be quiet. You understand? So your uncertainty, frankly, and this is important. I hope you're listening to this 556 guys. Your uncertainty should therefore be currently limited to A, the performance of 556 bore silencers you haven't seen and how they stack up to 30 caliber models on 556, and B, the actual threshold of hearing risk for an AR-15 at the shooter's ear. Those are those are your only two unknowns. Because <laughs> you already know all these how these 30 caliber silencers compare to each other in the supersonic flow regime. I mean, is the scaling going to be perfect? No. Is it going to be good enough for government work? <laughs> if you want to like really pick something, yeah, probably, bro. Probably, and you even you even have like a a, back, a predictive back pressure metric if you really want to get crazy with the thirty caliber silencers, which you probably shouldn't need to if you tune your gun. So, so to help you, to help you with foreshadowing, for B point B, the actual threshold of hearing risk for an AR-15 at the shooter's ear to help you with foreshadowing for that, don't get your hopes up. Okay, it's not going to necessarily be a fun time for you like a bolt gun is, dude. If, if For those of you who've shot a suppressed AR-15 and those of you who shot a suppressed bolt gun, be honest with yourself about what you're hearing. What do you hear with your right ear when you shoot an AR-15 versus a bolt gun. What do you hear with your right ear? Be honest with yourself. What do you think is louder? Okay, so when have you ever, ever shot a semi-automatic rifle and and said to yourself, boy, I could shoot this all day <laughs> without ears? <laughs> My right ear feels just fine. All day long I've shot this thing. <laughs> so hope that helps. Come on, guys. I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to say your, your impatience is somehow unjustified, but at the same time, I'm like, really? Like that's what you're like 
hung up with right now? <laughs> I mean, frankly, I w- I'm a little, you know, a lot of people are asking for 9mm stuff and subgun stuff. That I think you should be more concerned with. 5.56? Five, like, I, I mean, I want to do 5.56 five, too, but really? 5.56? Five, five, That's what you're... <laughs> okay. You guys, like, you guys understand silencers, right? I mean, I've been t- telling you about these things. Okay. Topic two at a time of, <laughs> sorry, 30 minutes and three seconds. Yeah, another... <laughs> I just got done dogging you for wanting 5.56 data. I'm about to talk about 5.56. Five, another 11 and a half inch mid... <laughs> I mean, why not? I also picked up, um, I, you know, I picked the, the, the Knight's Armament URX4 for this one because apparently I like to suffer for aesthetics. I like to look good. <laughs> I, you're like, is this guy bipolar? He, he might be. Look, I might be. Now, listen, uh, I'm, 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 I'm doing another 11 and a half inch mid-length upper for a couple of reasons. Good reasons? Well, I don't, I don't actually know. If they are good, but but they're fun reasons, and let's talk about them. First reason, first reason, Faxon eleven and a half inch mid length gas barrels were in stock. Someone gave me a heads up on Instagram. I so what did I do? Well, first of all, I grabbed one for myself. Then I shared it. <laughs> Self preservation. <laughs> I grabbed one, then I shared it to all of you, and then you all bought them all. I think it was a Midway USA or something. Then Joe Bob's Outfitters has some. I don't know how reliable they are. You know, everyone knows. That as soon as you buy a part, a gun part, you have to do a new build, right? So I I find upper builds to be great because I find that I don't need to build another lower if I build another another upper. Yeah, see how that works. I just keep building uppers. Saves money and time, right? You just keep building upper uppers. Then that's the great thing about the AR-15. Oh, you want a different type of upper? You want a different handguard? You want a different caliber? Just build another upper. You keep your lower the same. I just use my Anderson. Is my post sample Anderson now for everything? It just it's it's suspect, so it works with everything. I put the OBC buffer in it. I'm in spring. I'm good to go. Good to go. Speaking of which, I need to try that with 300 blackout subsonic. Uh, yeah. Oh, so the second reason, 11 and a half inch mid, um, the upper. I my, my current. Okay, so the current 11 and a half inch mid, it might up might end up being a P Science test upper. Like for real, because like to the point that it might get compromised. And then I wouldn't be able to use it for a def- like defense like I do. So that did concern me. Like what happens if something happens in testing because I'm doing something with it? And then I'm like, oh my God, I don't, I don't have my 11 and a half. And what would I do? You know what I mean? So that concerned me. So I figured it was, a, it was good to build another. I just ended, I didn't think I was going to like it as much as I do. And I love it so much that I'm like, I just need one personally. You know what I mean? So like, okay, well, let me just buy some parts. So third reason... <laughs> third reason I did it, and this is part of it. See, this is all part of my sickness, my, my obsession. So third reason was the, the Knight's Armament URX4. The sheer perfection, the, the, the length, the aesthetics. It, it, you know, it's the only, to me, really, when you really think about it, it's the only good-looking non-quad rail handguard that exists right now, right? And you just, the, the, ten, the 10 and 3 quarter inch, the 10.75, the URX4, uh, it's the perfect length for the 11 and a half inch mid, like even more so than the, 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 the old school quad rail I have, the free, the mid length free float, uh, rail adapter system that the one you guys see on me post that rail, it's just a, it's a little shorter than to, to make it super, super pretty, pretty, but the URX four, just like the, the, the clean lines and the, the length is just perfect for the 11 and a half inch barrel. And, um, the only problem the only problem with the URX4, and it is a problem, <laughs> is that it, it it is its own barrel nut. It is so you you have to physically rotate the the um the handguard to to tighten it to the upper receiver. <laughs> you have to turn the whole <laughs> you have to turn the whole handguard. Oh excuse me. Oh sorry. Um, you have to turn you have to turn the whole handguard. Because it's it's integral. You're literally screwing the handguard to the upper receiver. Um, you can imagine uh, the complication with having to do that. Well, what about your gas tube and your gas block? Yeah, yeah. You, you you may be thinking, Jay, the gas block can just rotate fine within the rail. So can we just do that? Well, you kind of can. <laughs> the gas tube, <laughs> gas tube can't rotate with it. <laughs> 
<laughs> is the problem. And then, you know, how are you going to do it? Anyway, there's, a, there's actually a couple ways. There are a couple ways to do this. Um, you you, you kind of, you kind of have to, well, there's a couple of ways to do it. You know, I'm, there's a couple of plans of attack. Like one, one could, one thing, one thing you could do is you could, you could just install the handguard. You put the barrel in the upper receiver, install the handguard, get it all torqued up and perfect. And then, you know, pin your gas block to your gas tube and then put it on the barrel with like a PVC pipe or something like push it on and hope that you can align it right. <laughs> I don't even know how do you do that. I guess with like a bore scope or something and make the gas port and then make minor adjustments with like your fingers. Like maybe you'd have to heat it. I don't even know right now. Like I, it's giving me anxiety thinking about it. So there's that or what you could do. And this is something I thought about. And like someone on Reddit said it once I remember. And there's some guy, I can't remember if it was a Pew Science member or not. Right before I started recording this podcast, he DM'd me because I posted this to my story. He DM'd me. He said, dude. And he he like screenshotted the Reddit thing. Some dude said earlier a while back where like basically like part of the URX4 instructions are that you have you basically have it. There's shims, as you can imagine, because you have a certain torque spec, right, for the handguard to the upper receiver. And what you want to do is you want to clock it to like 11 o'clock before you you know, do your final torquing anyway. So, you know, I, I'm not going to read you the, 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 the installation manual right now, but suffice to say, one thing this one guy came up with, which kind of made a lot of sense was he was using a clamp on gas block. So what he did was he figured out what torque he was going to use and needed. And then, um, he was able to clock to 11 o'clock in a position where he still had access through the M lock slots in the handguard to be able to screw, like get his proper torque on the gas block clamping screws. And he could also get his, a punch through to pin, pin the, um, the gas tube. So what he did was he basically installed his gas tube onto the barrel like you like he would normally do without the handguard present did the installed the handguard because the handguard can rotate around the gas tube because or i'm sorry the gas the gas block i just said the gas tube i meant gas block he installed the gas block like he would typically right when the handguard not there the easy way everyone knows how to install a gas block and then he installed the handguard afterward by rotating it around spinning it and it was fine because the the gas block can clear the inside of the rail and then what he did was he was like, okay, my get my handguard is clocked at 11 o'clock. So my, my M lock slots are aligned such that I can still fit a, a torque driver through there for the gas block, uh, clamping screws. Then he f- fished his gas tube through the front of the, the handguard. <laughs> And shoved it into the upper receiver, like further than it needed to be, and and then worked it forward, shoved it into the gas block, and then because his handguard was still clocked at eleven o'clock, and his M lock slot just happened to line up, he could pin he could pin the the gas block to the or the the gas tube to the gas block through that slot. Everything was hunky dory. Then he torques the handguard the rest of the way to twelve o'clock, and he, it's timed right. So it's like basically he built a ship in a bottle. By you know what I mean by putting the you know, so you know so there's that method, or I guess you can just brute force it, and just in, in pin the gas gas tube to the gas block first and figure that out. But I don't know. It all sounds stupid. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so it's, I'm gonna give it a little. I don't know. But you know, the the case is just a system. It was it was designed to use. Okay, so the KAC system. It, you know the, the this thing was designed to use their proprietary gas block and everything. And I'm pretty sure it's easier to deal with than your aftermarket stuff. But you know. I'm going to give it the old college try. Now, there are some things working for us. One, 
One thing that's working for us, mid-length gas. So the gas block is really close to the front of the handguard. I feel like that's good. You can kind of see it, see what's going on. <laughs> so that helps, uh, theoretically. And, you know, the M-lock slots it seem to help. Kind of, you can use them to access things. That is kind of cool. Um, I'm going to try to get that superlative arms clamp on block block to work and if i do i'm gonna be like yeah I'll, I'll let you know if i don't well i'll throw it through the wall um some things that are working against us uh, aligning the gas block uh if i don't choose to put it on first that's gonna be a problem um, another thing working against us shimming the handguard to rotate the to the perfect clock position with my ocd like that's gonna be a problem i already know Oh, and some guy told me today that the dude who wrote the Knight's Armament Installation Manual for the URX4, um, that dude told this dude that uh, the guy who wrote the manual recommends using blue Loctite instead of aeroshell grease between the handguard and the, the upper receiver, dude, like on the threads. Not because it loosens, which actually doesn't make any sense but be, because supposedly in their testing to see like to, to knock it around to see like if it would get i guess they say loosened but i guess it, it he he said it's not it's not to prevent loosening but this is literally preventing loosening because it's like he was saying that if you knock if you knock the upper upper assembly on something really hard apparently they stood a better chance of having everything staying put if they used blue loctite instead of aeroshell grease even when torqued correctly, I was like, really? You're going to torque this to like, what is it? What's the torque spec? Like 70 foot pounds and 90 foot pounds or something stupid for this handguard? That's a lot of torque, dude, for a hang aluminum handguard, I think. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, that was interesting. So, that's going to suck because anytime you use a blue Loctite, you're like, well, especially if I have to do this, like, how long is it going to? I don't know. I guess it's not hard to break through when you're using a torque wrench. It's just that I just makes me nervous. I don't I don't know. It's, I, I've always used aeroshell grease, so I'm like blue Loctite. So there's that. Um, I don't know. My you know my mid length, my, my free float RAS, the rail adapter system, the quad rail. It doesn't have. I didn't have to use Loctite on that. I torque tighten my thingy. It's fine. It's different though. Anyway, so yeah, it, is this going to be a pain in the butt? You bet. You bet. Are the aesthetics worth it? I mean, are you worth it? I I'm worth it. <laughs> yeah, dude. The, the aesthetics for like, oh my God, have you seen this thing? Have you seen how beautiful it is? I mean, if you're going to go, if you're going to go with an M lock rail thing with not a non quad rail and you're not going to go mid length RAS or Daniel Defense quad. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to get URX4, right? What, you're going to put a Geisley rail in your... Come on, man. Let's get let's get with the aesthetics train, guys. The 11 and a half inch mid with the, um, the URX4? Come on, man. With a Voltor MUR? Come on. Oh, Will at Magpul, if you're listening. Okay, for the record, for everyone listening, Will at Magpul wants you all to know. That I am not the first person to put a URX4 on a Voltor MUR. He did it in 2018 and his rifle's on his Instagram account <laughs> for you to see. Happy Will. <laughs> Cry, baby. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Love you. Um, so, yeah. Um, the aesthetics are great. Also, it has a built in uh, uh, sling swivel, uh, quick disconnect thingy. Um, which you know, like Aero Precision make puts the puts that on their things. So now Nice Arm it has one in there. I like that. That's nice. I don't know why people don't like those. I like them because they're QD. I can take it apart real quick. And people say, "Oh, you should use a uh, uh, paracord or five fifty cord or whatever." And you can do this. I'm like, yeah, but, but yeah, but we have the swing sling levels. <laughs> I know. I'm just I'm a I, I'm a boomer. It's fine. I am wondering, you know what I am wondering about? I'm wondering about heat buildup. My quad rail uh, doesn't get that hot um, with machine gun fire. And the, this URX fire uh, uh, handguard might. And that'll be a good data point for you. See if I burn my hand and how fast I burn my hand. I can tell you that. I'll do some mag dumps with it. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to post a photo of the build parts 
uh, with this episode. So you'll see the difference between this rail and the old rail and stuff. And this rail is smaller diameter. It's, uh, not, it's a little bit longer, but it's a little bit smaller diameter. Oh, excuse me. Hold on. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. So the, um, so it's pretty durable, and it, I think folks will find it easier to grab, easier to hold. It feels good in your hand because it's all smooth. Yeah, because, you know, to make the, the quad rail really smooth, you got to put panels on it. Well, that makes it really, really fat, too. So it's, like, not as, like, grippable. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I have a forward grip. That's part of the reason why I have a forward grip on my, uh, my mid leg rest to, like, both to create an index point of where I grab with my support hand, um, which I like for repeatability and uh, to, for comfort and, like, that muscle memory training. And it, uh, it uh, helps me kind of grip the gun a little bit better when I kind of do my little C-clamp uh, 2005 era Magpul grip <laughs> or whatever it was. Oh yeah, so um, so yeah, it's neat. I like it. Oh, by the way, I should I be I would be remiss if I didn't mention I do have a URX three point one. I don't know if you guys know the Knights Armament URX three point one rails. It's like it's like half half quad rail, half not quad rail. Yeah, um, and it's my in my opinion, it's the best of both worlds because you got the Picatinny on the front, and then you got the thin grippy grippy time uh, more aft of the front part and it's cool because you can put like a little stuff on it so um but but the handguard is like 13 something inches long uh wait 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 how long is it yeah 13 something inches long so it's more appropriate for a longer barrel than 11 so it's not appropriate for an 11 and a half inch barrel so it's going to be going on a barrel that's longer than 11 and a half when i finally build one uh, an ar that i'll i like for that length in 506 i have ars that are other calibers that i like that are longer barrels um i have an 18 inch 556 no i have an 18 inch 556 i also have a um what came with my transferable m16 i don't know something weird it could have been 18 inch or a 20 inch i think it was an 18 i think i have two 16 or 18 so i think i have two 18 inch 556 uppers but that's long and i don't actually the two uppers like one of them is like for a machine gun because it's like just it has this crazy like rail on it that's like really bulky and crazy and cool and old school i like that one for full auto but the other one i have is it has a it's a ballistic advantage barrel and it's just not i don't really like it um and that's an 18 inch so i don't like that so what i'm gonna do with this urx 3.1 is i'm probably probably going to um i've been talking with some folks i talked with a student noveski um i was thinking i was gonna take like a a barrel he has with like intermediate gas and then cut it down to like a perfect length for the urx 3.1 rail just make it gucci that's what i'm gonna do so i'll do that too so yeah I, I, and i and someone um oh shout out shout out to mckeith at dead air he had the same he had the same idea and he talked to me about it so we're both gonna do that i think i'll let you know how it goes uh, it's not happening right now but it will happen I promise it was going to be awesome. Okay, topic three at a time of, we're blowing through this. Topic three at a time of 48 minutes, eight seconds. It's good. We're right on time. I needed to finish this one fast today. So submit some administrative items to take care of. Uh, Pew Science odds and ends. This is important. And I use this podcast to address Pew Science members a lot because I I feel like this is a very, um, very efficient platform because a lot of you listen to it so it helps me yeah it does i might send you a member email but you're more likely to listen to this a lot of times and care about it so um like i was saying uh, probably not a a new publication this week for members or the public i mean i'm not saying never i might i i might give you something but uh i don't know It, it it there's too many test reports and analytical tasks on my plate that I can't really afford to take away from that. Now we, we'll be back um, publishing stuff soon. I wanted to take a moment to update you though on the current state of the research cooperative and administrative and fundraising items of interest. Okay, so one second, let me drink a water here. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so first thing, <clears throat> went down the wrong pipe. Uh, first thing, um, the the, the published data set at large 
is robust, okay? Um, we're going to continue to show 30 caliber silencers on 308. Um, uh, that is more of them, okay, just to build that large data set. But we are also in the midst of adding things, okay? So don't lose hope if you haven't seen your favorite or desired silencer. Um, uh, and, and when I say adding things, like not only 308 but other cartridges. Uh, so as always, reach out with requests. Uh, via the, the pro email address. And if you are not a pro member, just use the regular uh, tech at pewscience.com. Okay, that'll, that, that'll help. So if you have any specific requests, I do read all your e emails. So please send tech at pewscience.com. Okay, it's very important. It's very important that you communicate. Um, the second thing, um, actually to which I alluded earlier, public 556 data is probably going to first appear in the form of Mark 18 test results and analysis. Okay, there are a few reasons for this. I like to increase complexity by adding variables in a controlled fashion. Okay, and the Mark 18 allows us to do this very well. And and with not only its fixed gas block, gas port configuration, right, but the known and standardized 0 0.070 inch diameter gas port and the H2 buffer weight and the mil spec carrier and the 10.3 inch barrel length okay this is a standard system and standard systems make excellent test hosts okay so the 11 and a half inch is being tested as well but i do propose to all of you strongly that the mark 18 be shown first i do i do propose that and i think it's prudent and I, it, it also it's going to give you a reasonable lower bound Okay, which is good for everyone involved. Okay, so trust me on that. Okay, third thing. Third thing, fundraising. Fundraising to keep the effort going. Uh, okay, so here's the thing, guys. This effort is monumental. Okay, it takes funding to run Pew Science. Okay, you, you guys ever see the Firearms Policy Coalition? You, know, you guys, I don't know if you are on Instagram or social media, they, the, at gun policy on Instagram. Okay, um, I don't know if you, you've seen them before. They're a pretty good organization. Uh, just I'm giving I'm using this as them as an example right now. All right. You know what they do with the fundraising they do? The the people who donate to them, they pay their lawyers so their lawyers can continue to do work for the organization. Okay. I and I, I'm not necessarily comparing Pew Science to the Firearms Policy Coalition. Okay, it's not the intent of this, but there are some parallels, okay? And so it takes professional skills and knowledge and acumen to perform the analysis I show to the public, okay? Just, it is what it is. It costs hours, okay? And hours cost money. So that's why there is a membership function in place. That is why. If there was any doubt, <laughs> okay? Um, without membership, the effort will not occur. It won't. And trust me when I say it, like I'm not messing around. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to continue Pew Science without your support. I just won't. So it's, it's not feasible. So it, it doesn't make sense to do it. So to that end, uh, I will be increasing the ways with which you can contribute to the effort. Um, I thought for a long time I did. I thought I thought it would be a no-brainer for people to contribute like a small monthly sum to the effort. That's why I came up with the membership tiers. I was like, you know what? This is like not that much money. Um, in the big scope of things, like the effort is so monumental. Um, you know, I thought there's, it's a no brainer, you know, people would just, they, they're going to keep it going so that we can have the best and most complete cons, you know, suppress small arms testing organization in the world and the most hard line and impenetrable consumer advocacy group for silencers ever. Like that's what I wanted to create. And that's what I think I've created. I have now, I was almost right that people would donate, um, because a lot, and, and they do, a lot of you see the benefit, but some of you, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, just by the nature of human beings, some of you, I think, would like to get more out of it than the big picture for whatever reason. Just your personal proclivities, you, 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 your logic dictates that you, you, you want more than the effort to succeed. You want personal immediate benefit, so... Um, I will sell you things like t-shirts and patches and stickers and coffee mugs. These things I will sell you so you can receive an immediate tangible benefit. Now, all the proceeds of these items, these physical items, physical manifestations of Pusan support, all of these items will 
um, the proceeds will feed back into Pew Science, just like the membership does. <laughs> okay, so, you know, the, the item that now, the way I'll do it, or the way I propose to do this, is that the items will first be released to members. And after members have had a chance to purchase things, then they will be released to the public. Seems fair. You know, those of you who threw your hat in the ring or you continue to throw your hat in the ring, well, you probably should get first dibs. And I've said this before. I know I've said this before, but I'm actually doing some incremental things to make this a reality. So I just wanted to give you a touch point here to illustrate that I'm, I haven't forgotten it. I, and I have put a lot of thought into why I'm doing it. Okay, because it's not, it's not like, oh, let me just add another thing to my plate to deal with e-commerce. <laughs> let me just... Let me just add shipping and re- shipping and receiving to Pew Science. I already have shipping and receiving for test items. You know what? Now do soft goods, really? So I had to. It was a delicate decision. But I think I, w- I was looking to see how the membership would go, and if I even needed to sell soft goods, and I think I do. I just don't think you know. I just don't think people are are gonna be as selfless as I thought. I, I was like really positive with humanity and I'm really pleased and I was, I'm overwhelmed with your support. It's really great. I'm really pleased, but frankly, I think people want to buy swag. So, Hey, I'm going to try to create some stuff that looks cool. And you're like, want to rip the, you, you, you're going to want to rep peace science, dude. You're going to get some of this stuff and you're going to be like, bro, this is so cool. I'm like, I know I'm going to use it too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, hopefully it'll be cool. I'm going to turn it into a positive. We're going we're gonna to help Pew Science continue, and we're going to get cool stuff. I feel like that's a win-win. Yeah. You know what I should do? I should go down. I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to Sons of Liberty Gunworks. What's his face? Mike. He, he invited me. I'm going to go, hey, Mike. Bro, let me tell you the best thing you could ever do. Let's make a custom upper to sell people for science reuse. And he's going to be like, what are you talking about, Jay? And I'm going to be like, let me tell you all about the 11 and a half inch mid. <laughs> no. I actually have an idea. We could just do a whole line of them. Maybe we take we take all of the standard gas block sizes. I'm, I'm sorry. This, all the standard gas tube sizes. And we'd create barrels perfectly sized for like being the longest barrels or the shortest barrels you could use for each gas tube size. For five five six, and we and we I just offer them as the Pew Science line. Put a little Pew Science guy on it. Give me a cut. Give me a cut. Is that how that works? Let's hope it works. Okay. Finally, <laughs> the fourth thing. <laughs> don't take my idea. Patent pending. The 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 final thing. Um, there's been some talk about YouTube. Um, many people want uh, a Pew Science YouTube channel. They do. Um, I have expressed concern with this in the past, very in the very recent past, uh, due to YouTube controlling the publication of content as they host it on their servers. Um, I do not want to be at the mercy of YouTube and of the Google overlords. More than I already am. Frankly, we're all at the mercy of the Google overlords. How do you think things propagate on the internet? So, I mean, they're, they're, they're listening to this right now. Um, but, uh, or however, a real need has been highlighted, okay, in which hearing-impaired individuals have informed me that they use YouTube for podcasts because of auto-captioning. It's interesting. And I I know there are other ways to auto-caption. A lot of you folks on social media have informed me that there are phones, phone apps that do it, things like that, Um, different phone Different Android phones, I think, do it. I don't know if iPhones do or iPhones have an app to do it. Um, YouTube seems to be a very popular way to do it. It, it, Popular way for people to do it everywhere. Now, so I have decided that it is likely, it's not 100%, but it is a high probability that I eventually start publishing this podcast on YouTube. Um, in an audio only format. So don't, this isn't going to be in like some Joe Rogan thing. We're like, at least not yet. Okay. So, um, I eventually, um, will do this, I think in audio only. And I'm, I'm, I am considering this because I think it will also help expand the audience. I think it will. Now, if anyone listening has real experience with doing this with an audio only podcast, please, uh, let me know via tech at pewscience.com. I would appreciate your guidance and your suggestions and experience. Now, my current plan is to process my, my MP3s 
that I just upload with like a shot cut or some kind of free software, overlay a spectrum analyzer and the cover art for each episode and then publish them. That's it. Um, I'll probably like disable the comments on the YouTube channel and then just simply direct people to the comment section on the website page for each episode. So that way, if YouTube removes things or dies, the dialogue is maintained. I, I just don't want to house things on YouTube. I just, I want to minimize that. And I, and I'm not completely inept. I do understand like <laughs> the reach is not going to be as high without YouTube comments. I, I understand the algorithms. I understand that if you don't engage with comments, it's not going to be as popular. I get it. But also by not having the comments there, we're going to retain the immunity to the manufacturer and distributor shills that play the YouTube. Whenever you see a sponsor video on YouTube, there's people that jump in. Like I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to put sponsor videos on YouTube, but I'm saying like to, for example, the sponsor industry, um, anonymous platforms like that with no tracking that they have people that work for the companies that go on there and they say things to stir the pot. So when we inevitably start talking about things that are going to be highly controversial, like five, five, six testing on this podcast, you bet your butt that, I mean, it's already causing problems. This podcast is already a thorn in the side of tons of companies. I can assure you. Tons of companies love it, but a lot of companies don't, and it's going to get worse. So we have to do everything we can um, to to for the good of the effort and to protect the mothership, which is Pew Science. Okay, and so history repeats itself, and the science or industry is still the same as it ever was. Okay, Pew Science notwithstanding. So we have to be cautious. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not completely averse to letting the to to letting YouTube comments happen. I, I believe it can be okay. Um, but it is another thing to police, and frankly, frankly, I, I'm not sure that we need to deal with it. So we'll see. I mean, I'm not nothing set in stone, but those are my current thoughts. Okay, so I hope that helps. All right. Hope. Um, thank you for uh, coming to my TED talk. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Topic four at time. <laughs> time of one hour. One minute and fifty three seconds. Okay, yeah, welcome to all the new Pew Science members. You're the salt of the earth. You are. Through all of you, Pew Science is possible. And speaking of support, we're just talking about it. So thank you. You guys are the guys doing it. You are. And I think, and speaking of specifically this week, I think I have sent all of you new members an email, like as recently as a, like an hour ago. So I, I do appreciate you and I did receive a response from several of you this week others I have not please check your spam folders in the week or so after you join Pew Science because I'd like to send an email to start a dialogue with you and I do this with every member that joins so through you all things are possible you are directly supporting the science or industry innovation you really are don't let you know you know it's seriously like when uh, that that analogy I used earlier um, about the, the firearm policy coalition the gun policy when you donate to them, you're supporting grassroots effort to help legislation for pro-gun use. When you join Pew Science, you're doing the same thing for the science or industry because what you're doing is you're advancing the state of the technology. It's directly contributing to the research. It's directly competing, contributing to the advancement of technology um, in the industry, making silencers quieter and better and lighter and faster and bigger and prettier. I don't know what other adjective I can use about a silencer, but I'm telling you, dude, it's already happening. I can't, but I can't tell you a lot about a lot of it because it's like proprietary stuff for like certain companies. But like there are certain companies that would not be going in certain directions without Pew Science data. They wouldn't. And so the products you get are going to be better because of you contributing. You are partially responsible for quieter silencers, and it's already working, dude. Not even two years in, boom, boom. I'm, t- I'm telling you. Okay, I should also say. <laughs> <laughs> done tooting my own t- horn, own horn now, and your horn. I'm done, I'm done tooting your horn. It was a family show. Um, you know, also some of you, the general public, in fact, reach out with questions from time to time. A, a lot of new young scientists and engineers, um, or engineers to be, 
you know, in, in high school, um, or wanting to know how they can get started on the path to a great education and, and in a field they want to pursue and to figure out what is out there. You know, it just warm my, it warms my heart. I responded to some of you today regarding those types of questions. Uh, one of you, your, your email got lost and I, I got to it way late. And then you sent me a reminder email and that really helped. And so that, that goes for all of you. If you reach out and you don't hear back within a reasonable amount of time, you might have gotten buried. Uh, I'll try to do better. Okay, so just just go ahead and shoot me a. a you're not going to bother me if you shoot a, a follow up email. Trust me. If you want to remind me, do it. I'm not. I usually respond pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. So thanks, guys. Stick around. Some good stuff is coming. Have a great rest of your week, and I will talk to you folks again soon. Okay. Bye.